Welcome to Lecture 3 for Radiochemistry 702. This is the second part of the lecture on nuclear reactions. The readings for Part 2 are the same as Part 1, Modern Nuclear Chemistry, Chapter 10, and Nuclear and Radiochemistry, Chapter 4. The topics covered in Part 2 include reaction observables, scattering reactions, direct reactions, compound nucleus reactions, photonuclear reactions, and we'll end part two with a discussion on nucleosynthesis, stellar process that's responsible for the formation of the elements. We're going to start with light projectiles for nuclear reactions, and the first sort of set of nuclear reactions aren't really reactions at all, but really scattering. In elastic scattering, kinetic energy is conserved and particles do not change. Really this is the simplest type of reaction, scattering, for instance, as an example of an elastic reaction. There's no change in particle identity in the process and uh, scattering will have a contribution from nuclear forces. So for this reason elastic scattering can be a way to understand uh, some behaviors of nuclear forces in the target that is scattered, that scatters the projectile. An example of some, some other low energy reactions with light projectiles is one that we're interested in would be slow neutron reactions, so thermal neutron reactions. This is the really the, the purest example of um, compound nucleus behavior. There's a rate um, that governs this where 1 over uh, the velocity or the energy law governs most neutron reaction cross sections, so we see that we tend to see a decrease in a cross-section with an increase in the neutron energy. Um, the neutrons that are available uh, for these reactions can only come from nuclear reactions. Therefore, a range of neutron energies can be obtained since these neutrons are being produced in fundamentally the fission of a nucleus. Now, the reaction cross-sections, as we see from the data here, vary they generally start high, go low, but there's resonance peaks throughout uh, the energy regime that are, is examined in this case for the fission of uh, uranium-235 by thermal neutrons. Now there are some aspects of this uh, that are influenced by the particle. For instance, the reaction cross-sections are going to be influenced by the Coulomb barrier. And the Coulomb barrier prevents uh, charged particle reactions below 1 MeV. And here's an example of what one can see if we evaluate the, this is for neutron energy. As we increase neutron energy, we go from high to low. Now charged particles, they go low and except, you know, basically sub-Coulomb barrier. There's no reactions. The reactions increase with, the uh, cross-section increases with energy until the both parts at very high energies we start to get sections that are on the order of Barnes, fundamentally based upon the geometric mean. Other low energy reactions with light projectiles include deuterium or deuteron reactions. In these reactions, you can think about that um, with deuterium, you have one proton, one neutron in the nucleus. So you can think of almost that the proton is carrying the neutron around. So this is, in, in essence, you can think of this as a way of accelerating um, a neutron by exploiting the fact that that neutron is connected up with the proton. And some of these reactions can actually occur where the neutron can get into the nuclear, uh, it can penetrate the nuclear barrier while the proton is still outside most of the Coulomb barrier. And this is due to the fact that there's inherent large neutron-proton distance in deuterium. This, and this weakly bound uh, nucleus, uh, H2, can be broken up. The proton remains outside the barrier. So it's a way of uh, having neutron reactions that can exploit this charge of the proton. So you can fundamentally have these neutron-based reactants in, in, a, in an accelerator. Now there's a number of competitions among, among reactions, and they're going to defend, uh, really depend upon the probabilities for emissions of the various particles from the compound nucleus. 
these probabilities are going to be based upon you know, energy available, the Coulomb barrier, and the final states of the product nucleus. If the energy of a light particle is produced, the reactions can change. An example of this is for high energy protons, and you can get something called spallation. Spallation is if you use a high energy product, a light particle such as a proton, you're going to get a number of products that are formed within the immediate neighborhood of the target, let's say between 10 and 20 mass numbers. An example here is shown for lead, where a proton, high energy proton, this is hundreds of MeV, impinges upon lead, excites the lead nucleus with the emission of neutrons and protons. Um, you'll tend to make beta stable, uh, medium weight uh, products. And this route, spallation products, is used to produce neutrons at spallation neutron sources. Heavy Zs will produce 20 to 30 neutrons per proton interaction. And um, there's a web page listed here for the spallation neutron source that's run at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory that has information on this technique and the application of it for developing uh, neutron sources. The other reaction that will occur is that um, you can still induce fission with high energy neutrons, but the distribution of the fission products will change. And as we see here, here's an example of some data for uranium fission by successively higher neutron energies, 30, 45, 60. And what's observed is that the relative fission distribution changes as a function of energy and this is both shown for experimental and modeling data. The modeling tends to drive it, you know, there's a big difference here at 60 MeV. You get some differences in the distribution. But one of the trends that we do see is that uh, at higher energy we tend to get more symmetric distribution, particularly here what's observable is we see a decrease in this um, low valley number. These high energy reactions, uh, they vary from the low energy reactions by the way the uh, product nucleus behaves. At low energies, you tend to get a compound nucleus. So um, the products form and they tend to stay together at a nucleus. Now above 100 MeV, um, you start to get some changes where you get lots of excitation within the nucleus, a lot of the particles uh, start to become the neutrons and protons can get to higher energy states. Therefore, we can see some differences in behavior such as these uh, emission of many neutrons. These, you can Im imagine that these neutron emissions are fundamentally routes for de-excitation of the excited product nucleus where each neutron emission is responsible for dissipating between 5 and 10 MeV of energy. So the model for this is a cascade evaporation model. It's listed here, usually above 100 MeV reactions. Um, and the protons will collide with one nucleon at a time within the nucleus. These high energy protons make only few collisions in the nucleus, and they produce nucleons with high energy. Another route of reactions is let's move moving from lighter particles to heavier particles. So suppose using a proton think about bombarding a nucleus with something like oxygen-16. So we have these heavy ion reactions, and these heavy ion reactions, in a lot of ways, are similar to light ion reactions, where we can have elastic and inelastic scattering, compound nucleus formations, direct interactions, and deeply, interac uh, deeply inelastic reactions. One of the main differences between a uh, heavy ion and a light ion like a proton is that the heavy ion during the reaction can donate some of its nuclear matter to the reaction, whereas in a proton, it's either all or nothing. These reactions are in, influenced by uh, the reaction parameter, which is a function of this impact parameter. It's a function of the radius. It's also influenced by the kinetic energy of the projectile, the mass of the target, and the projectile nuclei. The mass and the target projectile nuclei are going to have an influence on the Coulomb barrier. So you can get information 
uh, about probabilities or uh, behaviors from scattering and Coulomb excitation based upon the radius information, which comes from uh, the mass of the projectile and the mass of the target. With heavy ion reactions, we can have inelastic scattering. And in this case, some of the projectile's kinetic energy is transferred to excitation energy in the target nucleus. Um, so this means that some of the energy can, uh, from the projectile can go into exciting the nucleon states within the target. Um, this can experience Coulomb excitation. So for high charges below the Coulomb barrier, um, can, uh, reactions can occur, and these can excite nuclei purely by electromagnetic interactions. So it's possible with some of these heavy ion reactions to observe uh, changes in the nuclei at sub-Coulomb energies. You can also have transfer reactions where part of the target, uh, part of the target, excuse me, part of the projectile is taken up by the target. So if you have a, uh, you know, think again, oxygen 18, you can perhaps just strip or pick up a few neutrons from the projectile to the target. And these can take place when impact parameters are just below those at which interactions um, that are purely Coulombic occur. Some of the results of this uh, can be measured with angular distributions, show diffraction-like pattern when transferred to a single well-defined state are observed. So you can get information about nuclear states from some of the behavior on these transfer reactions. Deep and elastic reactions occur when more of the nuclear matter is transferred than just these grazing uh, and incident reactions discussed on the previous page. There are, insert, there are some trends with this, is that the total energies of the products strongly correlated with the amount of mass transfer. So increasing mass differences of product and projectile lowers the kinetic energy. So this way, the nuclei that are involved in the reaction from the projectile to the tar target can be assessed by evaluating the kinetic energy of the products. Now, the um, complete interaction of the nuclei, the target and projectile, is called the compound nucleus reaction. Um, these reactions, as you can imagine, are probably the lowest probability with a high uh, mass, relatively high mass projectile. So these cross sections can be re relatively small. Um, during these heavy ion interactions, if you so the heavy ion interaction being shown here, where the nuclei fuse, there's uh, from when this compound nucleus is formed and it's in the excited state, it can de-excite with the emission of neutron evaporation. And this is the reactions that are used in heavy element production, where you get a compound nucleus formed and the emission of neutrons to form the ground state of the heavy element. These heavy ion reactions are needed for reaching the predicted ion, island of stability in the uh, heavy element regime. So Z of 114, N of uh, 184. And you can get an idea of the excitation energy that's necessary when you look at the uh, mass of the target in the projectile, the kinetic energy, and the binding energy of the projectile in the compound nucleus. So these terms can be used to get an idea of the overall excitation energy that's going to be uh, observed in the nucleus from a kinetic energy of a projectile. For the heavy ion reactions, an overview can, is listed here, the same figure that was shown on the previous page, where we can get per, uh, re collisions that are primarily elastic scattering some distant collisions where you can get Coulomb excitation of the nucleus. And as the particle comes closer to the nucleus, you can get some transfer reactions. These can also lead to deep and elastic collisions. And then finally, where we get the formation of the compound nucleus, where we get fusion of the particle and the projectile. As you can imagine, the cross sections will uh, 
decrease as you go from reactions where you don't have to have uh, complete interaction with the nucleus. So these cross sections should be higher than these and then larger than the compound nucleus formation. Now it's also possible to have nuclear reactions using photons. And these reactions uh, between nuclei and low and medium energy photons are dominated by a giant resonance. These excitation functions for the photon absorptions go through a pretty broad maximum, a few uh, MeV, uh, MeV wide is shown here for the reaction of photons on gold 197. And this is due to the dipoles that can um, set up within the nucleus between protons. One thing about the, the value here is in millibarns, so reactions, photon reactions tend to have on the order of 500 millibarns. And as we see, the reaction here is uh, gamma n, gamma 2n, gamma 3n. We see it goes through a maximum peak for the 2n reaction at around 14 MeV. Um, the resonance peaks, the way this figure behaves, is going to vary pretty regularly with the um, A of the target, 24 MeV for oxygen-16 and 13 MeV for bismuth. And there are a number here just shown gamma N reactions, but there are actually a number of different reactions possible including protons, neutrons, and alpha reactions. Now this has been used to also study uh, gamma fission is what's shown here, where uh, photons can be used to uh, drive a plasma wave, and we have reactions where we see, as listed here, photon-induced fission. This is actually a route where uh, there's been concepts to probe materials looking for uranium or other fissile material by activating the gamma fission reaction, and then observing the neutrons that can be emitted. We can use these nuclear reactions to describe what occurs in stars to produce elements. Now, um, this is driven by the fact that stars have high temperatures and densities to provide enough energy for nuclear reactions to occur. And once the elements are made in stars, they need to, well, they've been dispersed, for instance, to get here on Earth. Um, that the stars disperse their elements through nova, supernova. And these nuclear processes that we just discussed are the primary routes in which, are the only routes in which primordial elements are produced. And these include the radioactive elements that we see today, um, the natural radioactive elements, such as the uranium and thorium isotopes. So if we look at the chart of the nuclides, this black line here, those are all the stable isotopes. And we'll, when we talk about the nuclear processes, we'll work our way from here, from the Big Bang, all the way up to here to uranium-238, which isn't necessarily stable. But what we're going to see is that there's we could get all the way up to bismuth, and then somehow we have to make a leap to hit some of these radioactive isotopes. So those are the processes we'll discuss. timeline, uh, you know, the Big Bang quickly made protons, helium, and then it took a longer time to get to the distribution of these elements and uh, the formation of uh, elemental distributions here on Earth. The Big Bang was on the order of you know, 10 of the 10th years ago, very high temperatures. Um, upon cooling, forces were introduced, and within a couple of hours, helium and hydrogen, primarily hydrogen, were produced, along with free neutrons. So the, we can think about the origin of the elements from after the Big Bang, the gravitational coalescence of hydrogen and helium into clouds. Once these clouds got dense enough, temperatures can increase to fusion temperatures, and there's a list of reactions that are given here. So protons plus neutrons, 
going to deuterium, uh, helium-3, etc., peaking at helium-4 reactions where we get a lot of energy from fusion. Now going above uh, helium, we would make lithium or beryllium, but these were relatively short-lived, so they were not stable. And the initial nuclear nucleosynthesis lasted on the order of 30 minutes. Um, the free neutrons, they have a half-life on the order of 10 minutes. So after a period of time, free neutrons decayed and were no longer available for reactions. In stars, we know that uh, fusion occurs. In fact, this figure here demonstrates binding energy as a function of A for, and shows why fusion can occur. We know that um, this is our yield from nuclear fusion. This reaction here, the helium burning, of the formation of helium. Helium burning uh, has a few reactions. So we see here if we make two, if we fuse two heliums, we get beryllium-8. This is a very short-lived isotope and would not build up in stellar processes. Carbon is formed by three helium isotope, three helium nuclei colliding. This is a three-body problem. Uh, it's actually something that theoretically should be, or uh, conceptually should be rather rare. However, um, one of the estimations from this, if one looks at the energy, there should be this reaction would be the higher there'd be higher probability of this reaction occurring if there's a nuclear state around 7.4 MeV. This is called the Hoyle state, and if we see here, um, looking at the uh, the excited nucleus of carbon, we see that there's in a nuclear state about. Uh, 7.6 MeV, close to this predicted Hoyle state, um, and it's a zero plus state, which were the, some of the conditions so that we could have a rapid transition from the gamma from this excited state down to this ground state of the carbon 12. And this is one of the um, one of the hypotheses that was tested for nucleosynthesis of carbon when these energy states of uh, helium of, of carbon-12 were measured, that there was a prediction that there would be a state near this Hoyle band, and that observation proved to be correct. Now, from this binding energy curve, we see that we can fuse elements together all the way up to iron and still get energy. Above iron, and what we're going to see is that above iron fusion no longer is an operable route for obtaining energy and producing elements. Once we start producing carbon, we're able to uh, go move beyond carbon to uh, heavier elements. So this is an example of the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle, where carbon reacts with particles such as a proton to make nitrogen which decays to carbon-13, which can then make nitrogen-14. And uh, some examples are given here for nitrogen reactions. We can also have fusion of carbon-oxygen to produce heavier elements along with productions of al uh, alpha particles, protons, neutrons, or photons. The overall net conversion of four protons to an alpha particle is derived through these uh, summation of some of these reactions. And here's a figure that shows the relative atomic abundance as a function of atomic mass. And we see that this, is, uh, this reaction is actually related to the nuclear processes that occur. There's also a low amount of lithium, beryllium, boron. It lies off this line, and that has to do with some of the lack of nuclear stability compared to these elements. We've shown how elements can be formed up to iron, and they get uh, primarily through fusion reactions driven by the binding energy increase. 
Once we try to get above iron, however, we can no longer use fusion, and one of the processes that we rely upon is neutron capture. Very simple reaction, which, is, which for nucleosynthesis is called the S process, for the slow process. Slow being the number of neutrons. And this is responsible for the formation of elements of A greater than 60. That's an example. Imagine that we have zinc, stable zinc, uh, 68, captures a neutron, goes to zinc, 69. The zinc, 69, undergoes beta decay. That extra neutron is converted into a proton. We make gallium, 69. And as you can imagine, we can build our way up through the chart of the nuclides, hitting a great deal of the stable isotopes along this path. Through extension, we can go all the way up to bismuth through this method. However, from this figure, you can see that there are certain isotopes that we're not hitting. We're not hitting these isotopes here, these heavier stable isotopes, or these isotopes here, the lighter stable isotopes. And as a foreshadowing, we'll see that these, are, these heavier stable isotopes are made with something called the R process. The R process is when we have neutron captures on time scales that are less than the beta decay. So previously on the S process, it was slow. After capture of a neutron, the isotope had enough time to decay through beta. Well, in the R process, the capture of the neutron is so rapid that the isotope does not have enough time to decay by beta emission if it's radioactive. This occurs when we have neutron densities on the order of 10 to the 28th per meter cubed. You can compare that to, say, how much uh, water there is in a cubic meter of water. This is an extremely high neutron flux, and you get capture times that are in the order of fractions of seconds. And this can produce unstable, neutron-rich nuclei. So imagine that you're sitting out here at bismuth 209, and you have a capture of neutrons all the way out to maybe bismuth 238, and then you get conversion of those excess neutrons to protons through beta decay, and you wind up at uranium 238. Um, so you wind up forming stable or long-lived neutron-rich nuclei, and that's responsible for these nucleons living at this part of the chart of the nuclides and the actinides. This high neutron flux occurs during nova processes in stars. The formation of proton-rich nuclei or neutron-deficient nuclei occurs through this P process where we have a proton capture process, or we can have photonuclear processes at high Z, let's say, of around 40. These photonuclear processes, as we discussed earlier, can uh, result in emission of protons, alphas, or neutrons. As an example, platinum and terbium are from the P process. In the literature, there are various descriptions of the P process, and a lot of that indicates that um, exploration of the P process is still ongoing. But they're fundamentally, uh, the fundamental aspect of these processes is that they're responsible for the light stable isotopes being formed. A final process that occurs to complete the formation of the proton-rich uh, nuclei. It's something called the RP process, and this is for rapid proton capture. This occurs with relatively light elements from Z of 7 to 26. You get uh, proton gamma reactions and subsequent positron decay that populate these proton-rich nuclei. This is initiated as a side chain of the CNO cycle for instance, with sodium and neon isotopes.
This concludes the lecture component for Lecture 3 on nuclear reactions. This lecture reviewed nuclear reaction notations. We described how those nuclear reaction notations are developed. So one should be able to look at the nuclear reaction notation, understand the projectile, the target, and the produced isotopes. We also evaluated and discussed energetics of nuclear reactions. We talked about Q values and barriers related to nuclear reactions. We explored the different reaction types and mechanisms, discussed the correlation between particles and energy and how they influence reaction cross-sections. We described photonuclear reactions in addition to particle reactions. And the key component of this lecture was related to nucleosynthesis, where we talked about the different routes and reactions for the formation of elements and stellar processes. And we also talked about the influence of reaction rates and particles on nucleosynthesis. Some questions you should be able to answer based on the two parts of Lecture 9 are provided here. So for instance, describe the types of re nuclear reactions shown on page 11 of the second lecture. And these reactions are demonstrated here. One where you get some peripheral collisions, some grazing collisions, where you might get some interactions of nucleons, so some transfer of nucleons between the nucleus and the target. A fusion where you get complete transfer of nucleons, so all the nucleons involved in the target and in the projectile result in a compound nucleus, and then some sort of scattering where the Coulomb repulsion between the charged particle and the nucleus results in the particle not interacting but being scattered off its direct path. You should be able to provide notations for certain nuclear reactions as an example. Imagine that we have a reaction of carbon-12 plus lead-206 making stable gold. Please provide the nuclear reaction notation for that. Well, the projectile on this, we would say, is carbon-12. The target would be lead-206. So we'd write, we'd write it as this, where the lead-206 is first. The carbon-12 would be the projectile. You need to know what stable gold is. If you look in your chart of the nuclides, you'll see that uh, gold-197 is the stable isotope. Then from there to difference, the remaining material you can write as one isotope, and that would be fluorine-21. In a similar vein, you could talk about the formation of plutonium from thorium and a projectile. This is a fairly open question. You would use a thorium isotope as a target. Thorium-232 is the longest lived thorium isotope, so that would be a reasonable target. Thorium has 90 protons. Plutonium has 94 protons, so you would need a projectile of at least four protons that would form a compound nucleus, would form a plutonium isotope. So anything greater than four, you would have to include as one of the reaction products something that would take away those extra protons. So if you used carbon, you would have to have something with two protons coming off in addition to the four protons from carbon forming the compound nucleus for plutonium. As an example shown here, find a threshold energy for a reaction of cobalt-59 and an alpha particle that produces a neutron and the product nuclei. So again, we need to start with our uh, notation for the reaction, cobalt-59, alpha projectile, neutron comes out. The cobalt, if we go 2z higher than cobalt, we get to copper, and as opposed to four uh, increase. We only have three because one of the neutrons is also a side product. If we use the Q value calculator, we'll see that the threshold reaction for this is 5.4 MeV. And then what are the differences between low and high energy reactions? Well, one of the things with that is it depends upon what particles we're talking about. Often low energy neutrons have higher cross sections. They decrease and then they'll uh, reach a constant value. Sometimes there won't be any cross-section. So if, if you think about the uh, fission cross-section for uranium-235 compared to uranium-238, uranium-235 behavior is more like this. The slower neutrons have a higher cross-section. Where for uranium-238, we only see start seeing fission when a certain energy is, uh, is increased.
above. With charged particles, we have to overcome the Coulomb barrier. So once that Coulomb barrier is, is uh, overcome, we can start seeing reactions. How does a charged particle reaction change with energy? And this includes a neutron reaction, so we've already discussed that on the previous page. But as an example with another charged particle, more details, as opposed to just seeing a cross-section increase, we can see a cross-section increase with energy, and then we'll reach a maximum, and then as we increase the energy, the cross-section decreases. So an example with what we showed earlier, a proton on natural zirconium forming niobium-96. And the reason we get the decrease is that as we increase the energy, the energy of the compound nucleus starts liberating more neutrons. So what happens is as we increase in energy, we tend to make product nuclei that are lower in A. Other questions you should be able to evaluate, things like how are actinides made in nucleosynthesis? That's with the R process, the rapid process. So uh, a event in which a large number of neutrons are liberated where you get rapid uh, capture of neutrons and the time scales where those neutron captures are faster than the decay of the resulting isotope. And what is the S process? This is how the bulk of the elements are made. Uh, let's say from iron up to bismuth. It's the slow process. So where we get a capture of uh, an isotope, of a capture of an isotope to a heavier isotope. If that isotope's stable, it builds up. If that isotope is radioactive, since it's neutron rich, that neutron converts to a proton and it decays, so it goes up the periodic table. And it's slow in, re in relationship to the neutron capture. Basically, when you make a radioactive isotope with the S process, it has a very high probability of undergoing beta decay as opposed to capturing another neutron. We also discuss other aspects of nucleosynthesis, such as which elements were produced in the Big Bang, the lightest three primarily, primarily being hydrogen. What isotopes are produced by photonuclear reactions? And that's actually a question that basically says, well, what's your target? Because these are your primary photonuclear reactions, where a photon can react with a target nucleus releasing a proton. So that would be, uh, that would be decreasing the Z by one, removing a neutron, so decreasing the A by one, or removing an alpha particle, so inducing an alpha-like reaction. So isotopes that are produced, one of the answers would be, well, those isotopes that are close to the target, either uh, within one or two Z less. And what's interesting about the production of carbon-12 in nucleosynthesis, it's the Hoyle state, that high energy uh, state that lives in carbon-12, since the reaction is based upon this three-bodied reaction, uh, three heliums forming carbon-12. Uh, it has lots of energy, and there's that Hoyle state that lives at about the right energy so that that nuclear state can exist. What is the neutron concentration in the R process? From the lecture, we noted that the neutron density is 10 to the 28th neutrons per meter cubed. This is 10 to the 25th neutrons per liter, as there's 1,000 liters in a cubic meter. A mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. So if there's 10 to the 25th neutrons per liter, and one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd neutrons, there's 16.6 moles of neutrons per liter. So if you think about it, that's like the concentration of nitric acid is 16 moles per liter. Water is 55 moles per liter. This would represent a lot of neutrons. It's an incredibly high neutron density. And from the lecture, you should be able to look at data from the chart of the nuclides and understand how isotopes were produced. For example, identify the stellar processes for the formation of stable cerium isotopes. And as we see here in the chart of the nuclides, there are even stable cerium isotopes of 136, 138, 140, and 142. The lighter isotopes, as we see here, the 136 and 138, are formed from the photonuclear processes, so the P processes. Imagine that there's a photonuclear reaction on cerium-140, so a photon with two ends coming out would make the 138. 
and then a photonuclear process on 138. Again, a photon, two ends, would make the 136. The S process is responsible for the formation of cerium-140. Looking at the chart of the nuclides, you can see that there would be some lanthanum-139. This lanthanum-139 would capture a neutron, form lanthanum-140 with a half-life of 1.67 days. That would then beta decay to cerium-140. This cerium-140 would build up. If it captured a neutron, it would make the cerium-141. That has a half-life of 32 days. That would decay by beta. You wouldn't be making the cerium-142 through that neutron capture. Through the S process, you would need the R process. In the R process, you could either have multiple neutron captures on the cerium-140 or have lighter isotopes capture a large amount of neutrons, form something along the 142 isobar, and then decay up to cerium-142. When you have completed Lecture 3, please respond to PDF Quiz 3 and comment.